Good morning, everyone. Today, we'll be talking about the white lesions of the oral mucosa. In the previous session, we have talked about the red lesions of the oral mucosa. And today, we'll be talking about the other variety, the most dominant variety of uh, lesions which occur in the oral mucosa, which is classified under the uh, broad term as white lesions. Now, in this white lesions, why do we get white lesions in the oral mucosa? And that could be because of various reasons. The, the first or the most important among them is the increase in the layers, number of layers of keratin, which is the topmost layer. And as you all know, keratin layer is a dead layer with the, without any nucleus. And that uh, increase in the number of layers of this keratin gives rise to the white appearance of this particular lesion, which could be because of any uh, n number of reasons. The second reason would be the epithelial hyperplasia. Any such, any uh, particular uh, uh, etiology which increase uh, either hyperplastic or hyperplasia of the number of layers of the epithelial uh, layers, the different layers of the epithelium will give rise to a whitish appearance. Now that is classified un under as uh, under white lesions of the oral mucosa. Now similarly, uh, epithelial hyperplasia or uh, intracellular epithelial edema. Now there could be in the uh, middle layers of the epithelium that is a uh, spinosome layer there could be increase in the edema or the intracellular or intercellular edema which gives rise to again increase in the size of the epithelium thereby giving rise to the white appearance of that particular lesion or it could also be because of the reduced vascularity now because of the reduced vascularity there could be uh, this reduced amount of blood uh, supplied to this particular top uh, layers of the epithelium now that gives rise to uh, pale appearance or whitish appearance of the lesion. So these are the different reasons um, because of which a particular lesion uh, could be uh, uh, can be classified as a white lesion. Now white or yellow lesions could also be because of uh, an extra not an intra uh, epithelial uh, reason etiology but could be uh, extra outside the epithelium uh, layers uh, reasons uh, primarily uh, it could be because of an ulcer or it could be because of any fungal infections, fungal debris which can be uh, formed above the epithelium or it could be something, uh, any pseudomembranous layers which can be formed above the epithelium giving rise to that whitish or uh, yellowish appearance. Now the only difference between the uh, previous etiologies and this particular etiology would be this particular layer can be stripped off or can be peeled away from the uh, epithelium whereas the other, the previously explained etiologies cannot be done so. Now in the white lesions, the most common lesions have been uh, listed over here when we'll be talking about uh, each and every lesion uh, in detail. Now these are the most common uh, starting with leukoedema and leukoplakia and uh, going on. Uh, these are the uh, most common types of white lesions which are commonly found in the oral mucosa. The first among them is leukoedema. In the previous uh, years, uh, in the past, leukoedema has been called as pre-leukoplakia. Whereas uh, nowadays the particular terminology is no more used. Now in this particular lesion, there is a totally harmless lesion. There is nothing but a whitish appearance on the oral mucosa, which uh, is which disappears on blanching. So if this particular area, if, as you can see in this particular area, the buccal mucosa, you can see the whitish corrugated appearance or the wrinkled appearance which can be seen on the buccal mucosa. Now this whitish appearance on stretching of the buccal mucosa. Now, if you blanch that particular area, that particular area disappears. Now, this is called as leukoedema. The exact etiology is uh, an unknown. It is totally asymptomatic and sometimes it is found symmetrically on both the sides of the uh, buccal mucosa. Both of them uh, would uh, disappear on blanching or stretching of the buccal mucosa. Now, this is in a, a, a most commonly found in non-whites. It's more evident in non-whites. The uh, coloration would vary from whitish to slightly grayish. Now, uh, this is a totally harmless uh, uh, lesion, so no treatment is uh, necessary. Now, if the lesion is very aesthetically uh, displeasing to the patient, it could be removed by uh, laser treatments or laser uh, ablations of that particular area. Now, the second most common or the most common, uh, if I have to say, the most common white lesion which is found in the general population is leukoplakia. Now, leukoplakia is uh, nothing but, uh, if you break the terms, it is nothing, uh, leuco means white and uh, plakia is patch. So, it's basically a white patch which doesn't disappear on blanching 
or stretching of the mucosa else it would have been included under leukoedema now this particular lesion is uh, strange in its uh, uh, definition it's uh, itself saying that it shouldn't be classified as any other uh, or uh, disease or it shouldn't have any particular known etiology which can be classified which enables us to classify this particular lesion as any other category of diseases now if it doesn't fit into any other category then this particular uh, lesion is brought into is a termed as leukoplakia so it's basically an exclusive criteria which is uh, used for the diagnosis of this particular lesion it is not an inclusive criteria so as to say that if it doesn't fit into any other uh, lesions or any other categories of diseases then it's going to be uh, included as a leukoplakic lesion now this leukoplakia uh, depending upon the uh, it depending upon the appearance it is again for further classified as different types now as i said it cannot be rubbed off and it cannot be clinically uh differentiated into any other particular disease now the depending upon the type of appearance it is uh, uh, classified uh, because it's basically a clinical diagnosis histopathologically this cannot be uh, this white lesion cannot be uh, diagnosed as a leukoplakia because it's, it has no specific appearance as such it is only a clinical diagnosis so clinically how it appears depending upon that it is classified as either a thin leukoplakia or a flat a uh, thick leukoplakia or a granular uh, leukoplakia or a varicose leukoplakia or in any further uh, uh, severe cases it can be classified as a proliferative varicose uh, leukoplakia also known as pvl or the last uh, stage that is erythral leukoplakia or speckled leukoplakia now this is basically the uh, appearances of the different types of uh, leukoplakias now it's the, as you can see in this diagram this is a normal uh, uh, mucosa which is seen on the left hand side now there is no dysplastic uh, changes in the epithelial cells it is a normal epithelium with a normal uh, thickness of the keratin layer and the normal uh, number of layers of the epithelium now that uh, becomes as a, a thin or smooth leukoplakia because of uh, owing to the fact that there is hyperkeratosis there is an increase in the keratin layer so that uh, becomes a thick thin leukoplakia or a smooth leukoplakia now that it uh, the degree of uh, hyperkeratosis if it increases now then it becomes a thick or a fissured leukoplakia now as the layers of number of layers of keratin layer increases now there's also uh, there's uh, as you know keratin is dead and no nourishment so it it's a totally dry uh, area so there is uh, increased chances of fissures because of thick uh, owing to the fact that is increased number of layers of keratin so it becomes a thick or fissured leukoplakia now the further uh, severity it becomes more uh, obvious clinically that becomes a granular or varicose uh, leukoplakia now if this particular uh, area the granular areas or areas of hyperkeratosis becomes proliferative in nature it becomes pvl that is proliferative of varicose leukoplakia and then if it all breaks down and there's a total breakdown of the uh, keratin layer and there's appearance of the uh, atrophic uh, appearance or a reddish appearance of the lesion now this is the high risk form of uh, a leukoplakia there's very much increased chances that this particular uh, uh, uh disease is a uh, uh, is a put is a, as it is classified as a potentially uh, cancerous lesion so this particular a uh, lesion erythral leukoplakia has the highest uh, percentage of uh, probability of change or dysplastic changes into a cancer now these uh, nothing but uh, the different types so as i told this is a clinical appearance of the thin or mild leukoplakia as you can see it is just a thin paper like appearance well defined area which can be clearly demarcated from the surrounding normal mucosa uh, seen on the uh, left buccal mucosa over here which doesn't disappear on rubbing or the stretching of the buccal mucosa now it increases in its uh, size or increases in its uh, clinical uh, differentiation from the normal mucosa looks like a thick uh, piece of cardboard white cardboard which is pasted onto the uh, buccal mucosa uh, that becomes a homogeneous or a thick leukoplakia there could be uh, fissures also on the surface of this particular lesion now then we can see the granular type of uh, or nodular type of uh, leukoplakia we can see the areas of uh, nodular uh, hyper, uh, 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 proliferation of a varicose uh, type or a nodular type a pre uh, stage of a varicose leukoplakia 
areas of hyperkeratosis you know, that is called a granular or a nodular type of leukoplakia. Now the same type of lesion if it is even more severe and these particular areas become more nodal, more proliferative in nature, then it becomes a varicose type of a leukoplakia or a variciform leukoplakia that you can see uh, sharp and blunt uh, projections over here. It can be clearly demarcated from, uh, demarcated from the other types of uh, leukoplakias. Now the last, uh, the same uh, kind of uh, lesion, uh, it is also high risk uh, type of a leukoplakia. The proliferations become even more prominent now that becomes proliferative varicose leukoplakia. It is very rough in nature. And uh, the last the last one would be your erythroleukoplakia. Now in, in erythroleukoplakia, these uh, proliferations break down, really, uh, revealing out the reddish areas uh, beneath. Now this is the highest, has the highest probability of uh, dysplastic change or malignant transformation. Now uh, this is called erythroleukoplakia. In this particular the lesion, as such, is not invasive. Now, if it becomes invasive, then it ha it has to be associated with a malignant change or a dysplastic changes. Now, the etiology of the prognosis. Now, etiology as such uh, cannot be uh, classified as any uh, one single particular etiology since uh, uh, the definition of WHO says so. Uh, but most it is a combination of different types of etiologies. The most common among them is tobacco and uh, alcohol usage. Candida albicans infection has been indicated in few cases and also uh, trauma could have some etiology in the progression of this particular lesion. Now the clinical features as such it is uh, normally seen in the fifth or the sixth decade. Uh, the peak is between the fourth to six decades associated with middle aged or the older populations. Now, uh, uh, commonly seen on the lips, tongues, but the highest uh, percentage of this particular lesion is seen on the buccal mucosa bilaterally. Now, the treatment aspect of this particular lesion, now uh, this has to be kept under a regular uh, watch policy or a wait and watch policy. Now, if there is no, uh, uh, there is a total absence of dysplastic changes or neoplastic changes, then uh, we, we can just leave that particular lesion, we just wait and watch for any further changes in that particular lesion. And if it is not aesthetically uh, displeasing to the patient, we can just leave it as such. Now, if uh, on periodic examinations, there is slight indication of any uh, dysplastic changes, uh, ranging from mild dysplasia to moderate dysplasia to severe dysplasia. Uh, in those particular cases, what we have to do is we have to subject it to uh, excisions if it is a mild to moderate uh, dysplasia a wide excision with at least one centimeter of a normal mucosa surrounding the particular region has to be removed uh, using surgical uh, procedures now uh, for larger lesions if it is uh, very expansive in uh, nature then these surgical uh, uh, removals has to be followed up with a graft procedures now uh, thereafter again it has to be uh, subjected to periodic examinations and biopsies now uh, the surgical procedures uh, if it is uh, uh, on the lips or the tongue it could lead to uh, some kind of a scarring or aesthetic uh, display, uh, displeasure to the per, uh, patient so in those particular cases we could even offer uh, cryo surgeries or cryo removal of these particular lesions or laser removals which are more advanced or uh, more with uh, less amount of side effects or uh, post surgical complications than the normal scalpel methods the third type is a lichen planus that is a autoimmune kind of a, a white lesion commonly affecting the uh, females in the third or the fourth or the fifth decades of the life it is seen symmetric and bilateral in uh, nature uh, and it has a, a very specific or typical appearance of a become striae that is nothing but radiating white striae which are uh, uh, originating from a single point is appear, uh, can be seen in this particular lesion now, uh, this, uh, as I said, this is commonly uh, seen in uh, females, as you can see over here, uh, the appearance of uh, lichen planus on the buccal mucosa. Again, the most common areas of uh, presentation of lichen planus is your buccal mucosa followed up uh, by tongue or the, or the lips and then the palate. And uh, pathogenesis, it is basically an immunological uh, autoimmune uh, kind of disorder. Lichen planus is uh, classified as an autoimmune disease. 
So uh, the clinical features again, depending upon the appearance of a lichen planus, it can be uh, further classified as a reticular type or an erosive type or a plaque type or a papular type or a erythematous type. As the name suggests, you can uh, it gives you an, a slight indication as to the kind of appearance of a lichen planus. Now, in the reticular form, this is the most common form, and it has ha, has all the uh, typical features of a uh, lichen planus. The vicum striae. There is nothing but keratotic white lines which are interlacing with each other are present on the buccal mucosa. That is the vicum striae. It uh, forms a lacy pattern. That is a typical presentation of a lichen planus. Uh, that is a reticular form of a lichen planus, when which is the most common kind of the lesion. Now you can see over here, this is the reticular lichen planus uh, of the affecting the tongue. Now the, uh, the buccal mucosa, as I said, is the most commonly affected. Now then we have the plaque kind of a form. Uh, as, as I said, plaque is nothing, uh, plaque type means it would be a, a uniform distribution with uh, maybe or may not be uh, the uh, presence of a vicum striae can be seen over here. So in this kind of a lesion, it is a smooth or a flat lesion. It can be differentiated from a leukoplakia uh, in that it uh, it has the specific etiology of being an autoimmune disorder. Now it is present bilaterally. It is a symmetrical in presentation, and females would be more affected by this particular lesion. Now then we have the erosive kind of form. It is nothing but an ulcerative, uh, also called as ulcerative kind of a form of a lichen planus. The normal presentations of a uh, lichen planus is not seen over here. There would be a wide area of uh, erosive or reddish appearance, erythematous appearance of the lesion. The only indication uh, of this particular lesion being uh, a lichen planus clinically would be the presence of thin white striae at the borders or the periphery of this particular lesion. Now that gives an indication as to this could be a, a lichen planus uh, while we see it clinically. Now the treatment part and the most common or the first line of treatment for lichen planus as in with any kind of autoimmune disorders would be corticosteroids. Now depending upon the severity of lichen planus it could be uh, a, just a topical kind of corticosteroids in the milder cases or it could be systematic, uh, systemic kind of uh, corticosteroids in a more severe type of uh, lichen planus or in uh, cases which are more symptomatic where there's a lot of burning sensation of, for the patient, a lot of discomfort for the patient. And in these kind of cases, there could be, uh, we could opt for systemic corticosteroids. Now the fourth one is the canidiasis. As I've uh, also uh, spoken about this particular lesion in my previous sessions, canidiasis is one of the most important or the most common kind of opportunistic infection in a severely debilitated patient or uh, uh, immu uh, compromised or health, uh, immune immunity is compromised in these kind of patients. Now this is the first kind of lesion which is seen uh, in the oral mucosa or elsewhere in the body. It uh, commonly affects all the mucocutaneous areas. Also the skin is uh, involved in the severe kind of canidiasis. Now, as I said, immunodeficiency or any kind of uh, uh, systemic disorders which would actually uh, debilitate the patient or uh, reduce the immunity of the patient. Now, this is the first kind of uh, uh, opportunistic mycotic infection. Now, uh, this, uh, as the name says, it is caused by Canada albicans, which is the most common uh, uh, organism which is uh, associated with canidiasis. Now, the clinical features, the most common form is the acute pseudomembranous type, also called as oral thrush. Uh, in this kind of lesion, there would be a white pseudomembranous or a yellowish pseudomembranous layer covering the entire uh, lesion. Now, this can be peeled away on a slight amount of uh, pressure and it would relieve, uh, reveal out uh, reddish areas below the uh, pseudomembranous areas. Now, this is called oral thrush, which is uh, very commonly seen or the most common kind of presentation or an acute uh, presentation of canidiasis most commonly seen in elderly people or in young infants, both of which, both of them uh, have lowered immunity. Now the oral lesion, this is the oral lesion of acute canidiasis or uh, also called as white thrush. Uh, we can see the pseudomembranous whitish uh, or yellowish uh, plaque-like areas 
which are seen on the palette and which can be easily wiped away, uh, revealing out uh, eroded or erythematous or reddish areas. Now the other type, this would be uh, uh, just the opposite of this kind of a lesion, that would be the hyperplastic kind of uh, canidiasis. Now this again, we would see a rough area or a, a well-defined rough uh, increase uh, keratin uh, areas, which can be clearly demarcated from the surrounding areas. Now this cannot be wiped away on uh, applying of uh, application of any pressure. Now this <coughs> has to be uh, uh, given to a, a smear test or a biopsy test which would relieve, uh, reveal out a numerous uh, number of uh, canadal hyphae and colonies. Most commonly it affects the dorsum of the tongue. And now uh, this is most commonly seen which is anterior to the circumvallate papillae that is the most posterior inverted v-shaped arrangement of the papillae on the tongue and near the base of the tongue so anterior to this particular papillae this uh, particular lesion affects uh, the dorsum of the tongue now, other type is a most a more severe kind of a, a, a variant of canadiasis that is a mucocutaneous uh, canadiasis as the name suggests it's uh, it affects uh, both the cutaneous so the skin involvement as well as the mucosal layers uh, the old mucosa, the skin or the vaginal mucosa, all the mucocutaneous uh, layers are affected by this kind of uh, canadiasis, more severe kind of canadiasis and it uh, requires systemic antifungal medications. Now, uh, it uh, similarly, just uh, as in with uh, any other lesion, it just starts as an uh, acute uh, uh, lesion or an acute pseudomembranous uh, lesion. Uh, as an oral thrush and gradually it uh, involves the other areas uh, soon, uh, especially the nail and the cutaneous involvement. Now the treatment part, the hyperplastic uh, canariasis, again depending upon the severity of the lesion, it could uh, uh, either be a topical uh, application of antifungal medications or a systemic kind of uh, uh, application of antifungal agents. Now uh, uh, along with symptomatic treatment of this particular lesion. Now, uh, chronic mucocutaneous uh, canadiasis, as I said, is a most severe kind of uh, lesion. There's a uh, huge amount of immunosuppression for the patient. So, general uh, well-being or general health of the uh, person has to be monitored. Along with it, we have to administer systemic antifungal agents. Most commonly used is uh, ketoconazole, itraconazole or fluconazole. The dosages ranging from 100 to 400 milligrams, twice or thrice daily uh, for a period of 7 to 14 days. The other one is a white spongy nevus. This is a, again a totally harmless kind of uh, lesion, totally asymptomatic with, uh, without any uh, particular uh, uh, displeasure to the patient except for aesthetic uh, appearances. Now this is uh, an autosomal dominant kind of uh, lesion wherein there's a mutation or a point mutation of K13 or K4 which is uh, nothing but the type of keratin molecules which are present. In the, on the oral mucosa. Now this uh, particular lesion, there is a uh, mutation of this particular uh, K4 molecules or K3 uh, genes leading to this uh, clinical presentation of this kind of uh, white spongy neighbors. Now as the <coughs> uh, name suggests, it is nothing but a whitish appearance, uh, well defined to diffuse kind of uh, lesion which is uh, present on the oral mucosa, uh, predominantly the buccal mucosa. Or, uh, followed by the tongue or the lips. Now in this kind of lesion there will be a corrugated appearance of this white lesion. The surface would be slightly corrugated and wrinkled and this on uh, palpation it would appear very spongy in nature. Now this uh, gives us to the name as such that is a white spongy nevus. Now white it is spongy that is primarily because of the intercellular edema which is seen in the uh, spinosum or a granular spinosum layer of the epithelial mucosa. Now because of the increase in the intercellular edema this gives rise to the spongy appearance of spongy uh, texture on a palpation. Now, as I said this white spongy nevus is a totally asymptomatic lesion totally harmless so the treatment as such is not required for this particular lesion but if it is aesthetically uh, uh, disturbing to the patient we can always go for surgical ablation or laser ablation. Now, uh, on a clinical presentation, as I said, this is totally bilateral and uh, totally symmetrical. So it has to be uh, differentiated from lichen planus, which is also bilateral and symmetric. But this would, uh, the lichen planus would be uh, 
uh, again the gender predilection towards the female uh, gender and also the age predilection in the third to fifth decade and uh, also the symptomatic uh, uh, appearance or symptomatic uh, presentation of a lichen planus that differentiates it from the asymptomatic presentation of white spongy nevus. Next we have nicotin uh, stomatitis also called a smoker's palate. Now this as, uh, as the name suggests it is uh, the primary etiology uh, being the continuous usage of uh, tobacco the smoke uh, smoke form of uh, tobacco. Now uh, uh, since this is uh, the smoke type of tobacco primarily first uh, effects or first touches the palate this is predominantly seen in the palatal uh, region the hard palate and the soft palate region. And uh, again, the severity or presentation of this kind of lesion will have a post positive correlation or a direct uh, relation with the severity or the frequency of uh, uh, smoking in, the, in that particular patient. Now, uh, the clinical features. Now, uh, what this uh, does is with the smoke kind of uh, tobacco uh, that uh, actually aggravates or uh, there's an inflammation of the minor sebaceous glands. Uh, or present in the uh, hard palate or the soft palate. Now the pores or the openings of this particular sebaceous glands get inflamed. They become reddish in area and uh, that is uh, surrounded by a whitish or keratotic layer or a keratotic halo. So you characteristically find pinpoint erythematous areas surrounded by a whitish keratotic layer. That would be the clinical or the typical appearance of a, a smoker's palate. Now uh, the treatment as such, uh, the condition could easily uh, or uh, go into a malignancy uh, depending upon the severity or the frequency of uh, smoking. Now uh, as such, this is a reversible kind of uh, uh, lesion. That is the most. Uh, that is the good news in for this kind of lesion. Uh, stoppage or cessation of the habit na uh, naturally or uh, quickly regresses this uh, situation back to a normal kind of appearance of the palate. So uh, discontinuation habit is a, of primary importance of in this kind of lesion. Next we have this geographic tongue. Now uh, this is also called as a benign migratory glossitis. Now uh, as the name suggests it is a benign lesion uh, nothing to uh, no dysplastic uh, changes histopathologically. Migratory glossitis. Now glossitis is nothing but inflammation or uh, uh, inflammation of the tongue. Now this inflammation of tongue it not only affects a single uh, uh, particular portion and it gradually migrates to other areas of the dorsum of the tongue thereby giving rise to uh, its uh, synonym a wondrous kind of uh, lesion wondrous uh, kind of glossitis or benign migratory glossitis and it's most prevalent no uh, racial uh, uh, discrimination both whites and blacks are easily uh, affected now in this kind of lesion you have this uh, uh, glossitis areas of the uh, affecting the dorsum of the tongue, the tongue, uh, the affected areas becomes uh, totally deep appellated. It becomes smooth and red, and it is uh, surrounded by a white keratotic or a white uh, yellow keratotic or uh, raised uh, borders. Now the healing areas, this particular borders gets uh, get gradually uh, uh, mixed up with the normal mucosa, but the advancing areas towards which the lesion is progressing. They have pronounced white uh, uh, keratotic layers or uh, borders. Now this again is a other presentation, a milder presentation of the geographic tongue. Uh, you can see on the dorsum of the tongue, we can see well-defined areas of deep appellation and reddish areas and uh, affects only the dorsum of the tongue. Treatment as is a, it's a totally uh, self-limiting kind of a disease. Uh, it, uh, no particular treatment is needed. Apart from the fact that the patient may present with a, a, a symptom, symptoms like burning sensation of the tongue, therein uh, we have to give an, a symptomatic kind of treatment for the patient. Uh, as I said, symptomatic uh, treatment, uh, usually uh, steroids are given to suppress the burning sensations. Or uh, This uh, dorsum of the tongue is also uh, very much prone or this uh, deep appellated areas are very much prone for uh, topical or uh, opportunistic infections like candidiasis. So uh, we could also uh, give uh, topical uh, antifungal medications along with corticosteroids to prevent any uh, fungal infections. 
Next we have Fordus's granules. Again, this is a, a benign kind of a lesion. It is totally harmless to the patient. It is nothing but an ectopic uh, sebaceous glands. Not a present normally at the, this particular areas, but this is an ectopic presentation of the sebaceous glands. Uh, so as you can see, uh, commonly affects the lips, the upper and the lower lip, and you can see minute uh, presentations or minute elevations, whitish or yellowish elevate elevations, which is nothing but eto ectopic uh, sebaceous glands. Now, uh, as you can see, it is uh, you know, commonly seen as clusters, uh, widespread, uh, well-defined uh, choristomas, uh, predominant uh, sites present. Uh, this affects is the buccal mucosa and uh, especially the vermilion of the upper lip. Again, this is totally asymptomatic. Uh, this is normally uh, uh, considered as a variant of the normal. A developmental uh, variant of the uh, normal uh, presentation of the uh, uh, presentation of normal presentation of the patient so it uh, becomes more obvious after puberty since it becomes since it is considered uh, primary because of the reason uh, considered as a developmental uh, uh, anomaly as such or a variation of the normal uh, no treatment is indicated as it is a totally harmless uh, lesion Except for the fact, uh, since uh, especially if it uh, does uh, present itself on the upper lip uh, for aesthetic reasons, uh, it could uh, we could always go for uh, surgical ablation, uh, surgical removal. Uh, most commonly used uh, are the cryo uh, removal, cryo surgeries, or laser ablation of these particular lesions. With chance of recurrence is also very high. The last one, uh, last common kind of uh, white lesion is pearly K, also known as uh, with the synonym angular colitis. Now, uh, this commonly affects the commissures of the uh, mouth, the right and left commissures, colitis, uh, inflammation of the uh, lips over uh, at the folds or the corners of the mouth. As you can see in this particular, there's total inflammation of a reddish appearance, a atrophic appearance of the skin and the mucous membrane at the angles of the mouth or the commissures of the mouth. The most common uh, etiologies uh, could be, first would be the uh, loss of vertical dimension at occlusion in uh, older patients where there would be generalized attrition of the teeth or loss of teeth. Now because of the reduced uh, vertical dimension, the salivary uh, flow at this particular corner of the mouth gets stagnated gets prone for additional uh, opportunistic infections uh, like fungal infections. Now uh, that would uh, give rise to this uh, characteristic appearance or characteristic, characteristic presentation of angular colitis at the corners of the mouth. Apart from this, there is also thumb sucking or uh, excessive lip licking that would also uh, give rise to uh, angular colitis. Again, uh, primary because, uh, primarily because of the uh, excessive amount of saliva which gets accumulated at the corners of the mouth which gets a super uh, uh, super uh, added infections are more prone for setting in at this particular lesion because of the high amount of saliva at that particular lesion area now as i said uh, this could also uh, lead to uh, secondary infections uh, opportunistic uh, mycotic fungal infections as such, uh, it has in it has in the recent uh, classification of candidiasis, angular colitis has also been presented as a variant of uh, candidiasis. Such is the link between uh, this uh, fungal infection and angular colitis. As I said, the clinical features, as you can see, uh, it has uh, totally uh, erythematous fissures or erythematous areas, atrophic areas are seen in the corner of the mouth. With most commonly with with uh, super added infection they could also form an exudates and crusting of the lips at the corner of the mouth is also commonly seen the treatment as such since it's got a very uh, high uh, uh, link uh, or possibility with fungal infections it has to be uh, uh, super added or the treatment protocol includes uh, antimicrobial creams along with antifungal uh, topical uh, uh, ointments or creams now, apart from that, uh, we could also uh, get to the root of the uh, uh, presentation of this particular disease that is increasing. If it is an elderly patient, 
uh, if there is a reduced video, the vertical dimension and occlusion, we could always raise the particular uh, uh, vertical uh, height by giving a full mouth rehabilitation that would decrease the uh, recurrence of this particular lesion. Now, if it is because of habits like thumb sucking or lip licking, we could always advise uh, the particular patient to refrain from these kind of habits or habit breaking appliances. Now, that would uh, treat uh, that particular lesion. Now, these are the co most common uh, lesions, common appearances of uh, white lesions on the old mucosa and how we deal with them in our day to day practice.